How are we doing, guys? Um, welcome to another episode of the podcast. We have Angelo Morgan Summers here today. Um, where, where are you coming from? Is it the Isle of Man, Angelo? Yeah. What are you from the Isle of Man originally, or is it uh, like what brings you there? Is it is it the whole Bitcoin scene, or is it just um, that's where you're from? No, so I, I grew up in Wales, uh, in the southwest of Wales, which is equally as sleepy as the Isle of Man. The Isle of Man's great, says Wales, not really, but yeah, I grew up um, in southwest Wales, which is basically it's got loads of nice views, but nothing to do other than, I guess, look at the nice views, which gets old. So um, I've always been trying to look for a way out of there, I guess. Um, and yeah, so I ended up getting uh, going to the Isle of Man to make videos for, for Fast Bitcoins. Um, the one down of the story there is I started making videos by myself, just sort of test running it, went to a conference uh, and met Danny who's the CEO of Fast Bitcoins and basically told him what I was trying to do with the videos and he looked at some of them and, and basically said come and do that for us and uh, and yeah so I ended up going to the Isle of Man to make videos. Yeah so like the Isle of Man because like it just give context like I'm from Waterford in Ireland so it's very very like I've been to Wales a few times it's very like very samey you know it's really rural kind of middle of nowhere internet connection is still a problem in a lot of cases um so like making the switch from wales to the isle of man must be is that like a step backwards is it more rural in the isle of man or is it like more urban <laughs> <laughs> well yeah it's definitely more rural if you were to take the entire country of wales and put it against the entire country of the isle of man i'll put it this way the, the isle of man itself is like smaller than the county that I was from in Wales so it's a very small island and uh, well it's a country as well so um, I live in the capital of the country which feels weird to say because it feels more like a town to be honest but um, yeah it's uh, it's definitely an upgrade from the village that I was living in in Wales um, but yeah I mean Cardiff has got probably more buildings than the entirety of the Isle of Man put together but I was never in Cardiff so yeah, it's, it's it's an upgrade in that sense. I'm at least around civilization and people now. Yeah, that's cool. Um, no, because I, I lived in Malta as well for a little while. I think it's kind of a similar size to the Isle of Man. I, I think it might be a little smaller than the Isle of Man even, but it's like so packed there that um, it feels very like... It's not like the skyscrapers. It's just like everyone's crammed into the place. It's a bit mental. Um, Did you say Malta? Yeah, Malta, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I went uh, a couple of years ago. So cool. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, really it's good. I, yeah, we, we, there used to be a problem, like, because um, public transport, like, you couldn't you couldn't drive in Malta. It's just like total chaos. Um, the roads are totally packed. So, like, now having said that, public transport is very popular in Malta um, because of the whole the chaos with the driving. But like, often you'd have situations in Malta where like the bus would fill up at the very first stop. And there's be 10 stops along the way um, to the last stop. And it would just skip all 10 stops because uh, <laughs> like that's, that, <laughs> that's how busy it was. But um, yeah, so just like you wrote a really good book, um, the intro, like a, for a great introduction to Bitcoin, like the Do Bitcoin book. Um, just before we get into that, uh, like I know you, you have an interest in upbringing with regards like homeschooling and like just... I suppose a bit of an alternative, um, bit of alternative upbringing, and then it caused you to think a little bit differently, and it landed you into Bitcoin. And like at a very young age, you wrote like a you know a, a Bitcoin book. Um, do you want to just go in to say yeah, just just give your whole background and your journey into Bitcoin and like just homeschooling all that good stuff, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Yeah, sure. So um, essentially, it's it, I guess it started when I was. Uh, 12 because up until that point I had I was two years into secondary school at that point and although I found it a slight improvement on primary school and there were slightly more freedoms you were allowed you were slightly more respected in a primary school you're a child the, the whole way through um, but I never really fit into the the school system even even in secondary school either it wasn't working um, I think I was kind of a I was somebody, I've always been somebody that really values freedom and moves towards freedom in all cases. And uh, and I guess independence 
sort of comes hand in hand with freedom and in school it's like the antithesis of that and so I never gelled well with any of the teachers they didn't like me ever so that I think added a factor to it as well um it's not that I was like one of those really annoying kids that just wouldn't stop throwing shit around the classroom or anything it was more just like I I, I tended to ask questions that like they didn't like or, or find on YouTube ways of teaching uh or understanding the concepts that they were teaching in different ways and that's quite I think unfortunate when you're a primary school teacher to have some of the kids one of the kids just going oh you can actually teach it like this it was probably quite annoying but um yeah so there was a lot of friction there and I didn't really feel like I was learning everything uh, learning anything kind of for obvious reasons to be honest because I mean it was probably I think the final three years of my primary school education we were just, uh, I remember specifically in the history class, we literally spent three years on World War Two, and it was like the same lessons repeated, like the entire, the whole schedule for the year was just repeated three times because they just didn't bother to fill it up. And uh, it was supposed to be a good school, but later we found out that all of the results were forged by the headmistress. And so um, that kind of tracks, to be honest. But yeah, going into secondary school, it was a bit better, but I still wasn't really happy. And then I think I, I've always been relatively obsessive over various hobbies. And so whether it was, I think it was unicycling at one point. I remember I used to unicycle into primary school, fun fact. Um, weird, I know, but I found it fun. And uh, then it was magic for a bit and then yo-yos and it was just this mountain bike, everything and anything. I would basically attach myself to something and then it became all I would think about. And so going into secondary school, uh, I always found parkour was quite cool. And I guess that probably is a reflection of my uh, tendency to move toward freedom because parkour is like, I mean, you see people running across walls. It's like gravity says you can't do that and you're still doing it. That's like, you're free from gravity. That's so awesome. And so I was trying to get really good at that. Um, and somehow, yeah, the one redeeming quality that my secondary school did have is that they did offer parkour lessons after school. It was like something they were trial running with a, a local free runner that was basically trying to make a business out of it. And so I started going to these parkour lessons and uh, it was probably like six, seven months of of really enjoying it and, and getting good. And then eventually, you know, you can only teach a parkour class at a secondary school at a certain level before you have to start signing pieces of paper that say, you know, all the liability and stuff. So it, it kind of had a cap to how good you could get. And I started to get beyond that and was going into competitions and stuff when I was around like uh, 12 then and uh, competing in my age bracket obviously so it was nothing crazy but one of these competitions I I fucked up basically I, I tried to do a, a running jump between two pieces of scaffolding from a crate and then two pieces of scaffolding like eight foot apart were high high enough off the floor so that if you were to land on them like on your stomach, for instance, your feet wouldn't be able to take any of the impact. So that's exactly what I did. I, I jumped from one of them to the other one and landed on my rib cage rather than my feet, which is a suboptimal way to absorb impact, uh, if anyone was wondering. Um, and it caused some problems with my spleen. A few days later, I say I need to go to the hospital. It's still not feeling good. It wasn't like a, a sharp pain, like when you break something like when you break something it's kind of dull but it wasn't a sharp pain like a cut or or like a aching pain like a break it was just like this weird unsettling feeling in like that whole region so I was like, it just doesn't feel right went to the hospital they said your spleen's probably messed up we're gonna send you to the big hospital so they sent me to the big hospital which is like 45 minutes away because it's very rural um and so I get there they basically say there might be a tear in your spleen which is like if your the wall of your spleen was like this they said it's not popped because if it's popped you're dead by now but it could be like that and if it's like that then i mean you could cough and it could pop and then if you are living 45 minutes away from the hospital that would probably be fatal because it's a big sack of blood that filters through 80 percent of your body's blood supply every two hours so you've basically got two hours before 80 percent of your blood is leaked out of it so I was like shit that sounds fun um I'm gonna go home and question my life uh which is what I did and then sort of had a midlife crisis at uh, when I was 12 I, because of that it 
<laughs> reframed everything that I thought that I, I'd come to learn about life and it made me look at things that before I would be um, maybe just complacent or avoidant of. And one of those things was the fact that I, I was I found school absolutely repulsive. Um, not because it is in itself and everything, but just for me personally, I, I just didn't gel with it. And so I avoided that up until then. But at that point, I was just like, holy shit, I am actually in a constant state of mortality. Uh, and it's just that you kind of delay thinking about that until you sort of have to think about it. And so that reframed, I guess, my hierarchy of values in my head and and um, so I basically said it you know I don't think I want to go to school anymore I'm gonna look into it a bit and see if this is a completely stupid decision or not um, but I, I tried to go back a couple times but it didn't go well um, so I was basically I think what happened was because the scarcity of time was sort of like all I was thinking about during that period of time um, any sense of wasting it or wasting time became sort of associated in my head. This is what I'd imagined had happened, is that something, if I was wasting time, it was equivalent to dying because I had drawn a close um, association between those two ideas. And so going to school, as I always felt like it was a waste of time, it re-triggered a bunch of the emotions of the hospital and everything like that. So I basically said, I want to leave. Uh, I ended up writing like a 22 page document to my family, trying to convince them. And uh, it actually worked. So they took me out of school. Um, and then about a year later, I found <coughs> uh, Bitcoin. Well, I found Ethereum first, but uh, that led me on to Bitcoin and trying to understand uh, Ethereum by way of Bitcoin ended up leaving me a few years later writing the book about Bitcoin and not Ethereum. Um, and yeah, that's a whole rabbit hole in of itself, but yeah, so I found Bitcoin, I guess, that way, and then it just became something that just chips away at your attention until it's got all of it, and I guess it's been a process over the past few years of it eating up bigger and bigger increments of my attention, and the more attention you give it, the more things you notice, and the more things you realise about it, and then the more important it becomes, and so that you look into it further, and it becomes this sort of thing, until now I'm just a Bitcoin guy. It's just, I, I no longer do parkour. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a new obsession. Yep. But, okay, so just on homeschool, like I'm actually really interested in homeschooling. Um, I intend on reading, I don't know if you read it, but you know Daniel Prince, he wrote a book on homeschooling. Um, did you read I that? I have read it, no, but no, no, yeah, I no, haven't I, seen it. I'm super interested because I think that's, yeah, I'm, I'm not totally sure did he get his following from homeschooling first, then Bitcoin, or maybe it's just old Bitcoin, but I know that like it's a big deal for him as well. Um, and I have heard him talk about it quite a bit. Like, wh what does homeschooling look like? Do you have to do exams? Is it a structured day? Um, is there any curriculum or is it just like whatever the hell parents want to teach? Like, how, how does that look? So it depends a lot on the country that you're in. For instance, I think if you're, if you live in England, for instance, it is... Uh, mandatory curriculum but in Wales there's no mandatory curriculum in home education so long as you can prove that the child is receiving some form of education then social services can't come and take the child off you so I think my original idea was just to get through the next sort of sprint of the curriculum that I was doing at school but just do it quicker at home where I'm going at my own pace which is generally speaking you can learn something faster on your own than you can when you're having to tend to the weakest link in the chain of a group of 30 people. It just makes sense that, that you'd do that faster, and especially when you're using the internet rather than teachers that were, to be honest, not overly enthused about their, their job. Nothing against the teachers or anything, it's just how it was, you know. Um, and so I tried to learn it quicker at home, and then that same problem was coming up when I was looking at the books and stuff. It was just, I was studying shit, but there's absolutely no con context as to why I would need to un understand any of it. like. I remember looking at, um, we bought all the textbooks and stuff to do IGCSEs, which are basically the home education version of GCSEs that are slightly harder, um, but you can do them at home by issuing a course online. And I was bought a bunch of the textbooks and borrowed some of my older brothers as well, and I tried to start going through it, and I was like, thinking about the amount of time that, that it was going to consume, and I was just, I just couldn't see 
any way in which the actual information that I was learning would be beneficial to me, learning it in that way, where you're just trying to regurgitate it on a test and rather than actually understand it or find ways for it to be applicable to life. So it was just like, instantly, I felt like I was wasting time and then I felt like, because I felt like I was wasting time, all of that fucking accident shit just triggered and my brain just went, nah, you're not doing that. You gotta find something else, some other way to learn. So basically did away with the entire curriculum and just uh, ended up learning things that I thought would actually be relevant. I tried to reverse engineer the uh, education process by actually setting like a goal first, which seems basic, but you don't do that in school. You just learn the thing and come up, you, you do the work and then decide what the goal was once you've done the work. But generally speaking, that's not how goals work. You set the goal and then you figure out what work needs to be done to achieve it. So I set the goal, which was to achieve freedom in time, location and money. And then I was trying to figure out what I would need to learn or understand about the world in order to get there. And obviously things like business come up, things like money come up. And this was around the same time that I just discovered Bitcoin. And so, I mean, anybody that's looked into Bitcoin for a long period of time understands that it is not just one topic. It's like the amalgamation of 27 different topics. And by having that one focal point of I want to understand this, I want to understand how it works, how it's relevant, why it exists and what's likely to happen with it in the future. You end up having like economics, business, history, uh, like macroeconomics, and then actual uh, computer science, coding, mathematics, cryptography, it's all, there's all these subjects in Bitcoin. And so I guess Bitcoin sort of, I guess I followed a bit of a Bitcoin curriculum. Yeah, that's really cool. And it, yeah, I think to your point there as well, because there's so much in it, and this is particularly like guys that are very technically orientated that they look at Bitcoin and think because Bitcoin's a technology that they just, you know, they understand it straight away and then they just skip over it. And that's why, yeah, well, as you, to your point, like it's so many, so many, so many different things um, that it's much more than just that. But um, yeah, and it, like, I totally agree with you in school like it really is absurd to think that like I, I have always thought like look primary school I don't know maybe maybe you have to do that I'm not sure <laughs> but like definitely secondary school is just thousands and thousands of hours just wasted on nothing really and it's just accepted as the status quo because that's just the way it is and always has been um, and like even if it's just directed at nothing like even if so say you had a 12 year and look, I know kids don't know what they want to do generally till later. And that is one argument, but I think it's a bit, it's very abused in the context of secondary school. But like, if you take, if you take a 12 year old kid that decided he wanted to become a programmer or like computers. Now he could teach in his own time or learn it in his own time. But like, if he could just decide that he wanted to do that and then just drop everything else and then just spent the next six or seven years just learning programming. Like he'd walk out and go into like, you know, a hundred thousand pound a year job <laughs> at the age of like 18, but you can't do that because of the system. But yeah. Um, and as well, like, is it, so, so do you think like, so with regards homeschooling, so you just went learning about Bitcoin and stuff, but this obviously with the existing education system, um, it kind of like just programs everyone to think a certain way and it's like you know not very conducive to the creation of new ideas or like the best ideas how things should work um well i suppose it it, it would be different but like do, do you think homeschooling should be the norm or should just be like much more people should be doing it or was it just your own situation that kind of it just applicable to you like yeah what's your thoughts on it I'd say I'm somewhere in between those two. Like it's, it was definitely my own situation in, in why it applied to me. And it was definitely the best thing for me and it's worked out. But in terms of like, should everybody do it? It's like it, just logistically that wouldn't make sense because there's so many parents who just wouldn't be able to facilitate or, or accommodate their children for, you know, 24 hours a day. They have to go to work and so the kid can't be sat at home on his own. They turn on the gas and light a match. So you can't have the entire world like that but I think there's there's a larger group of people for whom it is possible and would be beneficial uh, than maybe we 
we realized because I was one of those people and it was never considered because I'd never really come forward with any strength saying like this is actually something I'm serious about it was more just I, I had in my head it was illegal not to go to school like when I was that age it was just that was my understanding it was something that like you know dad will come and get like my dad will get arrested if I don't show up to school sort of thing so you think well you can't just completely leave forever then but it's like well you actually can't and there's a lot of people I think that aren't considering it because well one it's a hell of a responsibility for the parent to, to take on and it also draws it's, it's a hard job for the parent because it draws a lot of criticism from their social group so you can imagine like parents have lives and friends and stuff and if you're the only one out of all of your your um your soccer mom friends that's actually homeschooling their kid it's going to be a lot of conversations to be had and stuff but yeah, I think it has been. I think it's beneficial for a lot more people than than we think. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. Like, especially if you're so like I kind of have a had a little bit of a similar experience. Um, like, did you go to university or did you not do that? No. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, I'm only twenty, so I would, I would, yeah, I would would have been. Yeah, that actually would have been two years ago. Yeah. No, I, I think you're. You're probably probably gonna do okay, I'd say. <laughs> Hopefully, like, uh, <laughs> um, you, see, you seem to have your ducks in a row. But no, like when university, um, I like I didn't finish that, so I start. I was studying business somewhere in Ireland, and then funny enough, like when I lived in Malta, I switched there for a little while, and then look, a couple of things happened. I got faced with some opportunities, and I decided to take them and leave college. Um, but like. I think that was the right decision for me and like definitely yeah it was the right decision at the time and the right decision like in hindsight like how things have gone but I don't think it'd be the right decision for most people even though I, I do think that university like it was kind of a total waste of time well, it, look it wasn't a total waste of time it was just what well, most of it was but because the fact you, you know, you get the certification, all that, that does help a little bit, even though it's just nonsense really, and probably is increasingly becoming less and less valuable as time goes by. Um, but the other thing is that like, I just don't think, most people when they leave university, they, they wouldn't be driven and they, you know, they just probably wouldn't really do what they kind of set out. So say they say they're gonna leave and they're gonna do this, that, whatever. Um, and it is hard, but a lot of people just wouldn't do those things. And, you know, maybe it's, there, there definitely is something to be said where you're kind of, I suppose it's like accountability. If you can be accountable to yourself, then it makes sense. But so many people, mm. like, just think of like TikTok culture, you know, just spending hours and hours and hours. Like, <laughs> you have to be accountable to just like delete TikTok from your phone um, to not get hooked by it. And so many people just can't do that. So if you're able to kind of take control then you can make that into a great thing. But otherwise, I think, you know, it does. I suppose the point I'm making is that with Garza University, in kind of like the, I don't know, skeptical list stuff as well, but you know, like red pill circles and stuff, it would be all like, you know, forget about that. But like the reality is for most people, they just won't, it, it probably would be better if they just held themselves accountable for some formal like certification. But what, what do you think of that? Do you, do you agree? Yeah, yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think you've got to like, you you have to if you're gonna give up one thing, like, if you have if you currently have a plan A, you can't just say I don't like plan A anymore. I'm gonna stop, and then just not have a plan B. Like you need to have something that you can switch it for. And if you unless you unless you have that unless you have like an actual goal or something that you want to achieve, it's probably not the brightest idea to just decide you're gonna go your own path. But then have no clue what your own path is like obviously there's going to be confusion and when I left school it's not like I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I was older um but like I knew what I didn't want it to be at least and in, unless you've got some sense of like what you value in that way it's probably not the best idea and I think also like so yeah if you've got some other plan cool or other opportunities like in your case then definitely and I think there's a lot of people that are afraid to leave because of what their parents will say and and what everybody will tell them and they, they think that they'll be called stupid for leaving and and there's a lot of fears like they don't want to upset their the people that are banking on them basically but like 
and that's all to get the certificate right but the whole certificate thing doesn't like really make sense because I mean it was only like what like a, eight years ago or something I forget the exact numbers but there used to be only like three institutions in the United Kingdom that could offer that could issue degrees that were licensed universities to actually give degrees three in the whole of the United Kingdom they started giving out licenses to these institutions making them universities such that they could offer degrees uh, they started handing it out like candy because the universities obviously are a big money maker and so they just started handing out all, all of these licenses and all of a sudden now there's like thousands of institutions all offering like 10 times the amount of degrees as the original ones even were so now you've got everybody has a degree in something and ha well that means that the supply of degrees has gone up has the price of it gone down no the price of them's gone up as well it doesn't make sense like you can't increase the supply of something and then increase the price too so the the actual supply and demand of degrees themselves i think are a little bit fucked yeah it's getting diluted down to like as you said as well the lowest common denominators um and it just goes down like i suppose when i was making the point that it wasn't a total waste of time because there was some stuff like over the course of like a four-year degree there might have been like really like three months of value maybe so you mm. know why or if you just if you just sat down and committed to reading like you know the i don't know the top the best two globally recognized books on marketing on accounting on sales every and then you just did that for like three or four months you'd be far better off than just if you did that degree like <laughs> so yeah and, and don't get me wrong like my whole approach is like definitely i'm treating myself like an experiment and i'm basing it on a hunch like it's not like i've got any master plan or anything it's not it's it's for most people it's probably not the best decision and it's been incredibly stressful as well like when you take the responsibility for your own future when you're 13 it's just like holy shit that it, you you basically enter the job market at 13 which is just not probably ideal in many ways but at the same time like i mean i'm still young but i can say so far i've lived an incredibly fulfilling life because i've i've stood on my own two feet in a sense and i think it's for that reason i'm not I don't harbour any sort of resentment that I think a lot of people can grow to accrue over time when they, they sort of live lives that other people decide for them. So I'm very much making an experiment of it and it's still yet to be conclusive. I mean, I'm probably only at like chapter two of the of the story, but, but I mean, so far it's going well. And it's not to say that everybody should go and do it. It's just, um, it's very much still an experiment. Yeah. That's, yeah, super interesting. Um, so like the, the Isle of Man, I know I know you touched on it. So, like, what's it like? Did you know anyone when you moved there? Because uh, funny enough, I've actually thought about moving to the Isle of Man as well, um, and I did look at it quite a bit um, in the past. But uh, a lot to do with the Bitcoin stuff. But to be honest, I wasn't really sure. Well, uh, yeah, what what's What's it like regarding, because I know they call it like Bitcoin Island on Twitter or whatever, like is there actually any Bitcoin stuff there really or is it just very, because I, I know with the thing like there's no capital gains tax in the Isle of Man so you can technically spend Bitcoin like it's you know your day to day, you can technically, you know, live on it without any tax obligations from the government and stuff like, um, is it widespread, is it common, um, yeah, what, what's it like? Yeah, there's quite a lot of places actually that you can go and spend bitcoin in in person i think on like the second week that i arrived here there was this cool skate shop called the boardroom and they accept bitcoin and it was just i remember being really shocked because you'd expect to see it maybe at like a skate shop or something like that um but when i was walking down the street and you see an old-timey pub with a massive bitcoin accepted here sticker on the window it's like whoa that's weird like this is a pub and it says bitcoin accepted here that's nuts um but yeah, I ended up buying a skateboard from that skate shop and I was just like sort of holding it in my hand like there ain't no way I just walked into a shop in real life and just paid Bitcoin and they gave me a skateboard. Like it was nuts. But yeah, there's quite a lot of adoption. So are you spending Bitcoin like in most cases day to day or is it still or like are you spending Bitcoin or are you just hodling it or what? Yeah, just hodling it. Yeah, you see, th look, this is the thing as well. Look, I totally get... I totally get we need to spend big and I do, I do spend it a little bit um just for certain things but it's definitely you know it's the idea of replacing it after but like I don't think you can 
you know, when you see in Bitcoin Twitter, like a lot of people are trying to force, like, you know, spend it now. You have to spend it to encourage this coming, this, you know, manifest the spending of it into reality. So everyone's doing it. But I, I just don't think that's how this really happens. And no, at the end of the day, look, don't get me wrong. I totally commend all the people building Lightning stuff. And it's going to become relevant in the future. But like, it's like there's no product market fit where there's very little in the West at the moment for that kind of thing everyone just wants to hodl it at the end of the day um because they all think it's going to be worth a ton more now like spend and replace is very is all well and good but like it's kind of like you're just trying to force demand for something that's not actually really needed um what what do you think of that do you agree with that assessment or like yeah yeah so i think um you're in muddy waters whenever you try to fiat anything into existence and by saying the only way that adoption is going to occur is if we tell a bunch of people to go and spend their bitcoin and then replace it which is something that in its current state takes more effort than just spending their fiat you're essentially trying to say that this thing you, you like if you say that that's necessary for adoption then you're saying the thing doesn't have legs unless you do what i say which i don't think is true I think it does have legs and there will be a, a genuine pull towards it rather than a, just a push. And so that pull, I think, will arise from different reasons, less on the payment side and more just on the store value side when inflation starts to, to ramp up and stuff and people will want to, to use Bitcoin more in that sense. But in terms of saying, like, we have to... I think what happens then is you, you, you look at, OK, what would happen if Bitcoin were to succeed? Well, people would be using it all the time. So that means that in order for Bitcoin to succeed, people need to use it all the time. So then you go around telling people, hey, you need to use it um, in terms of like spending it, because that's something that fits my picture of a Bitcoin adopted world. But in reality, that's something that is a byproduct of Bitcoin's adoption, the spending. It's not the driver of it, the primary driver. And so you're sort of taking a symptom and trying to enforce that and then saying that by enforcing this symptom, you will... Uh, have created the illness and illness is negative I don't mean it in a negative sense I'm just using it as a metaphor but yeah you that that's definitely a symptom that I think will naturally happen and I don't think we need to worry so much that if we don't spend then it's just not going to work because I don't think that's Bitcoin's primary uh, USP yeah because I think like as well to your point there like look me and you I I presume both of us, you know, we're kind of thinking in Bitcoin terms, like say our primary monetary saving is Bitcoin or whatever. Like there's going to come a point where we're just going to say when it's kind of acceptable, maybe acceptable is the wrong word, but there's going to come a point where we're just going to say, oh, look, just pay me in Bitcoin. I don't want pounds anymore. Like because, you know, the pounds or the euros or the dollars is slowly slipping away everyone's just going to come around to that themselves and they're just going to be spending Bitcoin, but just trying to force it. Like, besides, and look, this isn't to take away for people to spend their Bitcoin, um, but like spending Bitcoin historically has been like a very bad idea. <laughs> There's like a whole website, like I can't remember the name of it. You might know it, but like dedicated to like, you know, dumb things I spent uh, my Bitcoin on. It's like, you know, like, a, I don't know, like a Nintendo DS, like 4,000 Bitcoin, like <laughs> and yeah. it's like this kind of, crack but um yeah but um yeah so look you, you wrote a, a popular bitcoin book well it's it's i know it's very new but it's um to be honest it's really short and sweet um great intro to bitcoin but just before we touch on that like like how did you end up writing this book and like how long did it take you like what's the process of getting a book book for anyone that like did want to publish a book like this in the future um yeah when did you start doing it how long did it take and like what's the whole process look like yeah so i guess how it how it came or how i came across the opportunity was a uh, quite unique so it won't probably apply to most people but i I'd, I'd given a talk at something called the do lectures um which is kind of like a, a tedx but like on a smaller scale and they do they host this one event in in wales in cardigan that, that a lot of people come to and it's a brilliant event and really lovely people it's awesome and they invited me to come and give a talk and, and I gave the talk and then uh, with some of their speakers they offered them the opportunity to, to write a book because they own a publishing company and so they offered this to me back when I was 16 which is when I gave the talk but I wasn't 
uh, ready to write the book yet because I wasn't confident enough in my understanding of the details. I got the big picture on what was important and why it was good to have decentralization, but if you don't understand the details, that can lead you to crypto, which is where I was um, sort of on the tail end of the whole crypto side, uh, part of the journey. Because like I'd got the idea that, like, yes, Bitcoin, uh, uh, decentralization, love it, sounds great, permissionless, all of that, I get it. But then you basically are learning from a laptop on in your house, which means you are putting in search terms that the results are always SEO optimized results, of course. And the only people that are SEO optimizing their results are marketers. And so you end up reading a bunch of marketing material about Ethereum or altcoins or DeFi and stuff. and Think that it's actual educational material but it's not it's marketing and so it's easy to get sidetracked so that's kind of i was on the tail end of starting to put together the pieces of like huh yeah I, I, at that point i'd known that like 99 percent of altcoins were shit, but i was still like thinking there was like a use case for some of it and so i basically said no nah, i'm good uh I, I don't think so but a couple of years later then this was in 2021 20, yes yeah in 2021 uh, I just started doing the Bitcoin videos and started this thing called Permissionless, which uh, was basically me trying to create an, a Bitcoin education company. And then I, that's what ended up getting me into fast Bitcoins. But the uh, idea sort of had me thinking of other ideas of how to promote it. And I remembered that they'd offered me a, a book deal a couple of years back. So I basically called them up and said, hey, you know that book deal I declined like two years ago <laughs> or three years ago? Is that still going by any chance? Um, and basically we had a call, they said, yeah. And then I basically had three months to write it. And so it was sort of, in terms of like the second part of that question, which was, you know, what's the process of writing the book? It was, I think the, the hardest part is definitely writing the skeleton of the book, which is basically just the chapter outline and what you're going to talk about when, how long you'll spend on each topic. And there was a new, unique challenge with this one because I was limited to 20,000 words or around about 20,000 words, so I couldn't go write a 30,000 word book, which would have been easier because you've got a lot more room to uh, explain your ideas. But I think putting the 20,000 word limit on it was actually what probably makes this book quite unique in the in the Bitcoin book sense, because it everything that I wrote had to be incredibly condensed, which means I had to spend a lot of time thinking about sort of each section and each sentence and rewriting it a bunch of times so that I could get the same point across in less words and that obviously included a lot of use of metaphors and stuff which I think when I was thinking about how to write the book I, that was kind of my conclusion was that if we want a lot of people to come to understand Bitcoin and become enthusiastic about Bitcoin we need to get them to understand it and we're not going to get them to understand it by saying that Mining is a decentralized uh, consensus algorithm that is based on, you know, proof of work mining, which basically computes SHA-256 over the top of a bunch of lists of UTXOs. And they're just going to be like, what are you talking about? And so you've got to explain the, the fundamentals of the idea without using any of the lingo first, and then you can introduce the lingo. And I found that through my like home education journey, the only time that I would have a lot of or the most times that I'd have a aha moment when I was learning a subject was when somebody would explain it and then give me the lingo afterwards, rather than give me the lingo at the beginning and then trying to explain it with the lingo, because that's the only way that they can sort of shroud their own confusion about the topic. It's, and it was, well, I don't think it was Freud, was it? It was one of the guys that said, like, if you can't explain it to a child, then you don't understand it or something. So I tried to take that approach and explain it to somebody that had never heard of a computer before. So. Um, yeah, I guess it was trying to create a bunch of context around why Bitcoin was created or the solution or the problem to which Bitcoin was a solution and then trying to explain as quickly as possible the solution bit because that's what everyone gets hung up on but it's probably the least important part of the whole Bitcoin thing um, is how they managed to pull it off. The more important part is why we needed it and that they did. Um, so I tried to focus on that primarily. Um, rather than write the whole thing about how it works. Yeah, it's really good. Um, I'm just trying to get up here. Like, you have a really unique way of describing the whole... Um, I know there's quite a bit in it, so... I'm not, like, I'm not sure if you can do it from the top of your head. Um, but, you know, like, explaining how the whole protocol works with regards, like, the village analogy. 
Um, are you able to touch on that here? Just give, a, give an overview of like, because I, I just thought it was actually really good, really interesting way of looking at it. Thanks, yes. Yeah, so to be honest, I kind of consider that bit sort of the center of the book. Like that's what the, yeah, that, to me, that's the center of the book. And that's the bit that I wanted to get most right, which was after explaining a bunch of the problem, which is the easier part, then explaining the solution, which is where you lose people most of the time. Um, I, I was basically thinking, okay, how can I explain this problem without saying words that will cause people to shut off? And those words are like mining, proof of work, Bitcoin, computers, just computers in general. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if I could explain Bitcoin without even mentioning computers? And it was like, ah, okay, I'm gonna have to spend some time thinking about this now. And I guess I came to the the best metaphor that I could um, that was using mental models that people will have already formed throughout their lives and then applying those mental models to explain why Bitcoin is designed the way that it is and also how it's designed um, without really telling them the reader that I'm talking about Bitcoin and then later on in the book I explained that that was actually Bitcoin and if you just replace some of the words with different words then you're literally explaining Bitcoin and so I write this sort of little um, sort of uh, the uh, this analogy really um, that's talking about villagers who go about their daily lives using money etc and then they wake up one morning with amnesia they can't remember a thing and all of their money is gone and they have to rebuild a functioning civilization out of their village which obviously it's going to have to include trade because everybody's skills are specialized and so they need to continue doing what they're doing and make it so that you know the farmers aren't the only ones that don't starve to death um, and so they end up basically finding a ledger or a filing cabinet really full of a bunch of pieces of paper where they've been keeping track of or accounting for all of the trades that they've been making amongst each other in the village and so at this point they don't even know that money ever existed. They've never heard of the idea because they've got amnesia. And so they find these, these lists and they think, ah, we've been trying to do barter and stuff and we've been coming to the same problems that you are going to encounter when you have barter, which is you need the coincidence of once and etc. etc. And we've figured that it would be great if we had some third good uh, that was desirable by everybody at all times so that we could keep trading and the farmers could trade when they don't have crops. and and so on and so forth. We need a way to store the value that we're producing with our work. And they come across this list of all the transactions and they go, ah, that's it. This must be what we used before we forgot, our me before we lost our memories. And so they then have a new set of challenges, which is they assume that that is money, just the actual written things. And they can add up all of the amounts and it's mathematically sound, so they can figure out who, uh, who had X amount you know, who had this much money, who had that much money, and everybody was able to add up uh, all of their incomes from and subtract from it, the sum of all of their outcomes, and figure out how rich they were, so they had a bunch of fun doing that. And then they had to come up with a way that they could continue trade and continue using this money without coming to a bunch of disputes and without posing any security risks by centralizing control authority over that ledger without... Uh, at a singular point of failure where somebody could decide to run off with all the money or stop working or stop or just die and then all of a sudden you don't have a way to continue trade so they essentially come to bitcoin as their solution but without computers and just with pieces of paper instead and and then the villages end up being actual uh, analogous to nodes and the actual obviously the, the list of transactions is analogous to the blockchain and and they find a way to basically have a uh, consensus about the state of the chain, uh, the state of the chain of ownership by meeting at the end of every day and doing this Rubik's Cube race and the winner of the Rubik's Cube gets to add uh, the most recent entries to the ledger. And if you win the Rubik's Cube race, obviously you put a lot of effort into solving your Rubik's Cube. And uh, it also highlights how it's randomized and that the actual Rubik's Cube isn't the, where the value is. The Rubik's Cube is just arbitrary. And so everybody's doing this Rubik's Cube race and, and the more people that participate in this race, the harder it gets to beat. And so there's the difficulty adjustment in there. And so 
everybody's doing this Rubik's Cube race, it gets harder to beat. And then you have the game theory explained by the fact that if this race has got quite big and everybody take, is putting in a lot of effort now to solve their Rubik's Cube so that they can earn the prize of 6.25 Bitcoins, but you know, in the analogy it's, I forget what the, the, the money is called, but if you're putting in all that energy, chances are you're not going to want to submit a false record of, of what is owned because it won't, you can do it and you can pass it around to everyone and say, look, I solved the Rubik's Cube race. I, I did it genuinely. Here's my list of transactions. And it's just like one million pounds to me. And everyone's going to be like, nah, I, I know you solved the race and all, but no. And so that's literally what Bitcoin does. And I, I then try and basically go, that's all it is. And, and hopefully it's not too intimidating to people that don't have any background in computers or, or anything like that. Yeah, honestly, like it was really impressive how you, I've never seen it come up in that kind of angle. And to your point, I think that, um, I think that, well, like, I, I just think that that is the least, like when you're talking, like even people that are very experienced in Bitcoin, like they, it's really a tough time of trying to get that across to people without, because it, look, to be honest, it's even difficult to explain like yourself, there's quite a bit in it, quite a few moving parts, and it doesn't really all make sense unless you're able to explain each one accurately. But um, with that, like it's look, it, it sets it up nicely in the book. T to be honest, you should actually write like a, a medium article or like you know, Substack of like just explain, just put that as an article on the web, just that bit, like how Bitcoin works with the villager example, and then and then do show the definitions after and just say replace all this with these terms. And that's how it works. And then use that as a, like, well, if you want to learn more, just get the book or something. Because it's... Um, yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, because like, I definitely share that anyway. It's uh, like, it, it might even be the best way that I've seen, um, seen it explained. And to be honest, a lot of people don't even really try and tackle it in books. Like they give the technical explainer of it. But most of the people that read that book, then it just goes over their heads. So it's like, you know, you're obviously well aware of like most people how they learn is like through analogies and like comparing it to things they already know and like that's uh that that really makes it um straightforward so good job <laughs> thank you that's that's the best compliment i've had on the book so far I really appreciate it. <laughs> but um yeah so like just on the problem then look i, I know it's um like how, how would you I, I know we kind of went to the solution before the problem but like um just like what what do you think is the main thing that Bitcoin's solving like what's wrong with the current money we're using as, at the moment um i'll use the the villagers again since i've already set it up um if you had these people that had just forgotten money or just forget even maybe the villagers just think about you have a bunch of cells that evolve into talking monkeys on a floating space rock and there's scarce resources and they have to manage those scarce resources. They come up with money as a good way to do that. This is a productive solution. Cool. What does that have to do with governments? Like, there's no sense that the, the government serves a purpose, which is also an organizational role to organize the large groups of people so that they can co cooperate correctly. But that's what money does. Money does it for value. But there's, there's at no point in history has it ever been assumed that they should be tied together and when you do tie them together which is a very recent experiment and it is an experiment a lot of stuff goes tits up because as you know when power centralizes then so does risk and so if you centralize risk you're basically putting all your eggs in one basket and the basket breaks and everything goes tits up so that's not something you want to happen when you have 8 billion people on the world that all have atom bombs not a good solution so the idea is with Bitcoin, how about we separate money and state again so that we can continue living our lives as we were before and it was working before and uh, actually tying it to something that is physically expendable and is physically costly, such as energy, which is the most basic thing that drives human development. So it's the most fundamental commodity in that sense. You tie it to that so that the production can't be altered without expending that energy and suddenly it's secured by the laws of the universe and now you don't have to trust that a group of 15 people sit, sitting around a table once a year can do a better job at 
securing that which you store your human labor and energy in better than the laws of physics can secure the thing that you store all your labor and energy in. And so I think there's that the problem is so multifaceted in that sense because it's hard to see exactly when you poison the roots of a tree exactly every point at which uh, that has caused a negative effect in the growth of the tree because I mean especially when you've only got one tree you've only got one planet we don't have another planet to compare against like except I guess portions of history can serve as, as those that we can we can measure up today's world against and if you go to what the fuck happened in or WTF happened in 1971.com there's a good little thing that shows when we fully separated money from scarce resources everything that changed in terms of that and it's pretty mind-blowing to see how many metrics of human flourishment just got completely abolished like after that separation occurred and um and yeah so when you poison the roots of a tree it's hard to see exactly how it has affected the tree negatively because you can only see the one tree and you go well that's just how the tree is you can't say that that fallen branch is because of the poison it might just be because of the wind and it's really hard to pinpoint exactly how many ways the problem manifests itself in society but uh, I think yeah a general overview is is that about the, the tying together money and, and government yeah it's really difficult and I, I think um, yeah it's really difficult because you can't like you know it'd be great if you could like a b test like one society that has like you know operating off bitcoin in other society or two parallel worlds or something but you can't and i think this applies to a lot of like it'd be great to do all these kind of things with like you know homeschooling or like covid lockdowns and vaccines and all that stuff and money and everything but like all those things can't be done so it's like it's just like a thought experiment in your mind but like <laughs> with bitcoin it's probably actually going to force this reality anyway so if it keeps going the way it's going but um yeah so look that kind of just leads me on to the next question then so like um like with regards to bitcoin going on its current trajectory like do you think there's any threats to it like anything that can kind of like I don't know, ruin the whole thing. Anyway, this might play out like how we think. Um, is there anything you're thinking like that that could just stop this whole thing? Um, yeah, interest to your thoughts. Yeah, I think uh, a bad BIP, you know, that could definitely f screw with things. Um, whether or not that'll happen, I don't think it will, but it's always a possibility. Somebody could up update it stupidly and I guess the old version of Bitcoin would still continue on and so when that second version fails you can inevitably go back to the first so it's not a huge threat but I think it could pose a significant risk if it's a big enough problem and enough people don't understand why um, that's one thing uh, another thing could be figureheads that become very popular and sway public opinion uh, or the opinion of Bitcoiners about the direction that Bitcoin should be taken in and if it if those people are malicious then I guess you could end up taking Bitcoin in a bad direction um, again not a risk I'm overly concerned about but it's if I was to list them off that would be one of them um, and I think just general I mean to be fair if you'd have asked me a year ago I would have said general on like lack of understanding about it but even still without the understanding I think it's getting to a point now like where like, I was speaking to um, Obi Nwosu, who does the, uh, he's really heavily involved in Fedi, uh, which is basically an, uh, an app that's built on top of the Fedi Mint layer of Bitcoin, which is essentially creating a middle ground between first party and third party custody. Uh, they're calling it second party custody, which is basically rather than having your keys owned by one other entity, one third party entity that can just run off with them. It's owned by a consortium of guardians of a multi-sig and then you're basically able to offer like Charmian eCash on that so that you can trade with complete privacy and uh, without having any, having to take full responsibility for your own keys because that is something that I think a lot of Bitcoiners overestimate the capacity of average people to undertake. It's not necessarily the ideal solution. Like the, I heard a good quote that was like, the best thing about Bitcoin is that you truly own it and the worst thing about bitcoin is that you truly own it 
and it's like for a lot of people the the fear or the risks the of of the internal risks of themselves losing their bitcoin is too scary for them to even want to own bitcoin at all in any large amounts and so Fedi is basically a solution to that and it's making it so that people in the global south can actually benefit from bitcoin not because it's a way out of their tyrannical state or not because it's a way to avoid inflation or any of those things just simply because it's more profitable to operate their business on the bitcoin standard than it is with their current currencies and and when you see that start to happen and it's like hold on you don't even need to explain bitcoin to these people anymore you literally just need to show them that they could be making two up two extra dollars a day if they switch to it versus what they're currently using then they switch to it and it, it drives the adoption and so to be honest i i I think it's unlikely that it fails, very unlikely. Um, that's not to say that there's no chance in hell that it fails, and it's always worth being vigilant about that, but yeah, I guess as time goes on, there becomes less and less reasons to believe that it won't work. It's, it's always gone in the right direction anyway, as long as nothing changes. <laughs> um, that's the catch. <laughs> yeah, so, and yeah, like, I. I definitely think about the BIPs a lot as well. Like, the, um, just for anyone who doesn't know, like Bitcoin improvement proposals. So it's like, um, if if something went bad there, like, it could just set the. It could just set something up um, in such a way that, like, I don't know, could cause it to centralize or backdoor or so. Like you, you know, you've you've you hear about people like if BIPs were very easy to do and very easy to pass, then like when the US government decides that this is enough of a threat, they could just fund tons of developers to come in and try and like get these things and then have little things put into the protocol that will inevitably destroy it or something. I'm not saying that's likely, but like it's important. Like Bitcoin doesn't change in my opinion, the way that like, you know, other <laughs> protocols are changing every second week. Like, yeah um but yeah so like just uh with regards like is there anything you think bitcoin's missing at the moment that like needs uh needs to be built like any kind of whether it's companies products services applications layer twos is there anything that you think bitcoin desperately needs that you say that you find yourself thinking like geez i love bitcoin could do this for me um or i could do this with my bitcoin it, yeah do you have any thoughts yeah, so there's a big problem at the moment with um, banks getting in the way of or standing in the on-ramp, in between the on-ramp to Bitcoin. And so you try to send your Bitcoin to a, uh, a Bitcoin exchange and essentially it goes, nah, you can't do that because we own your money and we pretend to allow you to have some fun and play with it every now and then. But at the end of the day, if you want to spend your money on something that we deem inappropriate, we can just stop you from doing it. And I think although that may seem small, when you're talking about global mass adoption and there's a hurdle put in place, it's even just a slight altering of the trajectory, 10 miles down the line, you're very far from where you would have been if that wasn't put there. So I think there could be, it'd be really good if some, if there was some solution to essentially like build a bridge between the old and the new forms of money such that people can actually uh, not have to worry about any of those pesky hurdles and not have to, to sort of try to to basically have a juggling act between financial institutions. And if there was just some one place you could go to just have that all essentially laid out for you without having any banks stand in the way, then I think that would be a great benefit to, to the adoption because there's a lot of people that are on the edge and they go to try and maybe buy some Bitcoin and they're not overly enthusiastic about it and their bank says no and they go, oh, fine. Like they're not too, they're already on the edge. And so a little push can stop them from, from doing it. But, but yeah, if you eliminated that hurdle, I think a lot more people would be more open to the idea of doing it. Cause at the end of the day, as enthusiastic as Bitcoin maximalists uh, are and plenty of reason to be, there's still the undeniable fact that everybody has their lives and not all of them are going to spend all their time rabbit holing on Bitcoin Twitter about why this is the savior they're just trying to get through their life and little inconveniences like that can actually stop them from from being interested enough to go and make the switch and and yeah when you're dealing with something as important as dictating the 
the level of centralization that the future holds. I think it's important that we do everything that we can to eliminate those hurdles for the average person, because at the end of the day, that's who has stands the most to, to either gain or lose based on the outcome of the fight. So you're saying like a, a fiat bank to kind of like bridge the gap uh, to the Bitcoin world, is that it? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> it's um, yeah. It's interesting as well, like, it'd be good, very difficult, um, but very useful if that can, uh, that can happen. Like, there was an interesting thing um, I saw, have you heard of Custodia Bank in the US? Mm. Yeah, it's like uh, yeah. Caitlin Long's uh, bank. I think that got, re like, rejected for, like, to become an official bank, like, yesterday. So... Mm. Now, whatever reasons they give, I'd wonder, well, I'd be pretty skeptical that the reasons that they give aren't, I think they said it was to do with money laundering procedures not being in place and stuff, but like, I'd be pretty skeptical that they, that's the real, the real reason is you're legitimizing Bitcoin within the current system, I think. So mm. yeah, it'd be, there, oh, yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I'd just be wondering, um, that like they're saying they're gonna, litigate you know they're going to go to the courts and stuff because they do have everything in place yeah I, w I wonder how far that's gonna that's gonna go and will they will they be able to take him on and get in there because it's when that kind of thing starts happening you know that's when bitcoin is really like because i know we talked about like institutional adoption like last time around all bitcoiners were saying like you know institutions are here and this kind of thing but they weren't really they were all just kind of in for the the crypto vc kind of pump and dump kind of things like there wasn't you know that kind of thing you're talking about there that didn't and still doesn't really exist it's when you have that kind of thing happening it's like maybe you're in the final stretch because like then can't be stopped because you're you're within the bounds of their own regulation then so yeah remains to be seen yeah yeah i've seen there's there's a lot of that and there will be continue to be a lot of that where the, i think regulators give shitty reasons for why they are refusing the integration of new ways of approaching money such as bitcoin uh well bitcoin specifically um there'll be i think there will be a a lot of uh, friction between those pushing for Bitcoin adoption and those trying to maintain the status quo. I think it, you're not going to switch the monetary base of humanity without a hell of a lot of collateral damage, I think. Yeah. And just on that question in regards to the Isle of Man, like, what does it look like with regards to regular? Because I know there is no capital gains tax and Bitcoin's kind of found a bit of a haven maybe because of that. But is regulation like. I'd imagine because it's so small, it's probably quite local. And my understanding is that even though you guys use the pound over there, it's actually nothing really to do with like, you know, Westminster and like the the city of London governing the Isle of Man or anything. Um, what does that look like? Are they pretty supportive of this whole thing or do they just not really think about it? Um. Well, yeah, it is. It's. I think it's the longest standing uh, in Europe. I think the longest standing sovereign state in all of Europe. I think that's correct. Um, but yeah, the Isle of Man has been it has been going for for ages as, as an independent uh, country, and so it is. It's not. Uh, I mean, you use the same money and you know and all of that. But yeah, it is. It's independent item. But um. But yeah, the. Uh, I can't speak too much on the regulatory, uh, regulatory. Is, do you say regulatory? Regulatory, regulatory side of things over here. Um, yeah, because I'm not too much at the, the front lines of that whole conversation. But um, I do know that it's a small place and that it's easy to make change. So. Yeah, I suppose there's one. Yeah, like if if the UK itself was to become hostile, that doesn't necessarily mean the Isle of Man will follow. I suppose. Yeah, or vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Not that okay. the UK would ever follow the Isle of Man, but yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> like, get the point. But like, we need to take action. The Isle of Man has just made a ruling. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, so look, uh, unless you have anything else, I suppose uh, we, we can wrap up there. Um, do you want to just uh, just share the, like, the name of your book, where people can find you and where you can get the book and your Twitter, all that good stuff? Yeah, so the book's called Do Bitcoin. The front of it looks like that. Um, it's on Amazon. The link to it, I think, is in my Twitter bio. I should double check that, but I think the link's in my Twitter bio. I'm at Angelo underscore Summers. Um, follow me there and if while you're at it follow my brother as well at Bitcoin Theo uh, he's posting some cool stuff recently so uh, oh and one last thing check out Fast Bitcoin's YouTube channel because I'm going to start posting a bunch of Bitcoin educational material there that hopefully lives up to the standard of the rest of YouTube education rather than just um, yeah so that's basically my goal for this year is to to post a bunch of stuff there so yeah check that out Cool. And just on fast bitcoins in general, um, like what are you like? Do you guys serve like are you guys open for business? Are you serving like what do you do with fast bitcoins? Can I go there and buy Bitcoin on it? Um, yeah, so we're we're basically at the moment in terms of the internal stuff, it's um, well, not the internal stuff, but yeah, the we are essentially uh, a Bitcoin brokerage that won't sell you any shit coins. Uh, there's plenty of places that will do that. So, um, yeah, definitely check out Fast Bitcoins as well. Okay, cool, cool. So, yeah, we'll we'll be uh, tuned into any announcements from Fast Bitcoins and all that good stuff. So, yeah, okay then. Um, thanks very much, uh, Angelo. This was a good interview. And like, yeah, be sure to keep an eye on the YouTube and um, we'll catch up again in the future at some point and see you on the the Twitter Twitter sphere. Awesome. Cheers, man. Yeah, I enjoyed it.